Uh, welcome back to, uh, to ZK Study Club. In this edition, we are welcoming back Alex Ozdemir, who's, uh, who's previously spoken here on ZK Study Club. And today he's going to be telling us a little bit about his recent work with Dan Bonet at Stanford University, uh, collaborative ZK Snarks. So Alex, over to you. Yeah, so thanks for having me back, Alex. Um, and uh, last time I think I spoke about compiler infrastructure, if I recall correctly. Uh, so today is going to be a bit of a change of pace. We're going to talk about a new cryptographic primitive that myself and Dan have been working on that we call a collaborative ZK snark, uh, which allows one to write zero knowledge proof of those zero knowledge proofs about secret data that is distributed among many parties. Um, and so by the end of the talk, you should understand what a collaborative ZK snark is. Um, both in terms of syntax and security. Uh, and you should also learn something about how efficient collaborative ZK snarks uh, can be, how surprisingly efficient they can be. But first, um, I think it, it's good to, to start with the basics. Um, perhaps no one needs to be reminded why zero knowledge is useful, but uh, I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> um, so zero knowledge allows you to solve all kinds of problems. Um, but one classic problem, one classic security problem that zero knowledge is useful for solving is the authentication problem. In authentication, there's, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but essentially every authentication mechanism boils down to having some client show that they know information that only they should know. That information might be a password, it might be a secret key, it might be something else. Um, and during this process, it's important that um, the client not reveal that secret information, because if they were to reveal it directly, then they could be impersonated in the future. Um, and so they need to show that they know that information without actually showing the information itself. This is a zero knowledge proof. Um, and indeed, a ZK snark, which is sort of the, the general purpose, super powerful zero knowledge proof, can solve this problem. It's a little bit overbuilt, but, but it can solve the problem. However, ZK snarks cannot solve all problems related to zero knowledge. Um, in particular, they struggle when the secret information is not a single secret that one party, the client, has, but it, when the secret information is instead distributed among many parties. And that actually happens all the time. Um, so let's consider one example, money laundering. If we want to show that some entity, Eve, has obtained the ransom paid by Colonial Pipeline, that amounts to showing that like, in the global graph of transactions, there's a certain kind of path from Colonial Pipeline's ransom to Eve. Um, and give me a second. Yes. And in this instance, the... Uh, in this instance, it's, it's not simple enough to just look at the graph because uh, there's no single entity, no single bank that actually has a view of the entire graph. Different entities, different individuals, different banks are aware of different transactions. Um, so in this diagram, color corresponds to the entity that knows about the transaction. And showing that this path exists would require the green entity, the blue entity, and the magenta entity to collaborate um, in order to demonstrate that, that path exists. And if they wanted to do this without revealing um, exactly which transactions they know about or, or what particular those transactions are, they would need to somehow be able to collectively write some zero knowledge proof that this, this path exists. Uh, money laundering and, and general financial applications are not the only um, scenarios where this happens. Another example from healthcare. Uh, you might imagine that there are several hospitals in some kind of network together that want to show that they're charging fair procedure prices, that the, the price for some procedure, some particular procedure, doesn't vary too much depending on, on race or on some other protected class. Um, and so what they're trying to do here is compute an aggregate statistic over the uh, details of, of what procedures they offered which individuals at which prices. Um, and and that, that underlying data, uh, those, those procedures, that's information that's, that they probably don't want to share with one another. In fact, they might not even be allowed to. Um, like the United States HIPAA would probably prevent them from doing this. Um, and so if they want, but if, you know, if nonetheless they want to convince the public that they're charging fair prices, then they need some mechanism to, to collaboratively prove that the aggregate statistic um, is, has some favorable value. So the point of, of today's talk is basically to build uh, tools, a collaborative ZK snark, that's going to allow us to apply zero knowledge in the latter two scenarios, in, in, in the case where the secret data is distributed among many entities. Um, and so pursuant to that goal, um, there, there will be four parts. First, I'm going to go over ZK snarks. Uh, forgive me if you understand them already. We're going to focus in particular, though, on why they do not apply to distributed secrets. Uh, that's going to motivate our new cryptographic primitive, a collaborative ZK snark. Um, we'll learn both about its syntax and its security, and then we'll go into how we construct collaborative ZK snarks. Um, so we, we provide sort of a, a theoretical template for how to build them, and, and, and we um, apply that template to build a number of different collaborative ZK snarks. 
Uh, and then finally, I'll tell you about our implementation strategy, how we implemented them, and how they end up being surprisingly efficient. So um, giving up the punchline at the beginning, we're going to see that collaborative ZK snarks in, in the right situations can be just as fast to, to write proofs um, to prove as conventional ZK snarks. Um, so despite the fact that there's some kind of multi-party protocol, they're, they're not actually going to be any slower, uh, which, is, which is kind of surprising. OK, so that's the order of events. Um, I'll pause right now in, in case anybody wants to ask a question, and also because I'm thirsty. Uh, any questions from anybody? If not, maybe, uh, yeah, we just let's roll on. Well, just actually, I, I have a quick one on the healthcare one. Like the case that you had there was not about the data of the people, right? This was the prices, because yeah. I know the data of people has been floated many times as use cases, but to date, it seems kind of impossible to do just because of the politics. Do you feel like the prices would be a better, like, is there a reason why you chose more like price checks? So I, I, um, I didn't choose price checks for any, any particular reason. Um, and I think that the, the cool thing about, about a collaborative ZK snark is it's going to allow you to, to write a proof about any data that you want, whether, whether it's perhaps the health outcome of the procedure, whether or not the procedure was successful, um, or, or whether it's the prices. Um, and, um, you know, sort of the cool thing here is we're, we're using the notion of zero knowledge. And that means that whatever it is that the underlying data um, involves, that's not going to be revealed. Cool. Okay, so then let's charge ahead. Um, let me minimize the... Okay. So, um, the, the background, ZK Snarks. Um, so ZK snarks, there are these tools for writing zero knowledge proofs. We need a bit of formalism to understand what it means to keep information secret. Uh, and, and Andrew, um, could you, uh, sorry, just a quick reminder, if uh, anyone's not muted, could you just please mute your mics? Thank you. Okay, I think we're good. So yeah, the formalism that we're going to use for the purposes of today's talk to understand secrecy is the notion of a witness relation which is fairly simple. It's just XW pairs, a set of valid XW pairs. We regard the X as uh, public and the W as secret. And we imagine that there exists some prover that, that knows both, that knows the public data, knows the secret data. Perhaps the public data is what the average healthcare, uh, what, what the average price of a procedure is. And the, the secret data is how much every single individual is charged. And then there's a verifier um, who uh, knows just the public information and is wondering whether or not this, this secret information exists um, that makes the public information valid. And in sort of a straw man way that you can convince the verifier that this witness exists is you can just give the witness to the verifier and then the verifier can check. Um, but there are two downsides here. The first downside that's not so relevant to today's talk, but is good to know about is that um, in some cases, the witness might be very large. So and, you know, in the case of, the, of healthcare, this is like all the procedures that you did on everyone. That, that's very large. Um, and it seems like sending all of it to just communicate the single bit that my average was computed correctly is perhaps overdone. Uh, and then the more important downside is, of course, this is not private. This does not keep the witness secret. And, and so basically, ZK snarks, they just allow us to, to implement this workflow uh, while keeping W secret. They're sort of a layer of indirection. You don't send over the witness. Instead, you feed the witness into a proving algorithm. You get a proof. You send over the proof. You verify the proof. Um, and you get a number of desirable properties. Um, so, so sort of a key property is soundness. If, if, pi, uh, if, you, if the prover can come up with pi, then W should exist, zero knowledge. Pi should reveal, not be, reveal nothing about W. Succinctness, Pi should be very short, very fast to verify. Non-interactivity, Pi is just a single message the prover sends to the verifier. It's not some kind of interactive conversation. Uh, there's, there's one sort of weakening of soundness. Uh, this is a, a system that's allowed to be computationally sound. We're OK if Pi exists, as long as um, it's hard to compute Pi. Uh, and then finally, a strengthening of, of soundness, knowledge soundness. Um, a valid proof should convince the verifier, not just that W exists, but that the prover actually knows it. So this is sort of a laundry list of all, all the properties that, that CK snarks give us. The, the most relevant one for today, of course, is, is zero knowledge. Um, so the fact that this proof does not reveal the underlying secret information. Uh, and you can use um, zero knowledge proofs to do all kinds of interesting things. I, earlier, I had mentioned authentication as, as one problem that can be solved with zero knowledge. Let's look at how you might begin to build an authentication protocol from a zero knowledge proof. It, it's kind of a, a simple idea. You imagine that the client is going to be the prover here. They're proving that they know secret information. 
the verifier, that's going to be played by the server who wants to uh, be convinced that the client knows the secret information. Uh, the public key, um, that's X, that's the public data. The secret key, that's the secret data. And the, the relation that we're interested in here is whether or not the secret key public key pair is a valid key pair. Um, so that, that is like whether or not the secret key actually corresponds to the public key in, in, in the proper way defined by the public key crypto system. Um, and so you can you can just use a zero knowledge proof to, to solve this problem to show that your key pair is valid. Um, and you know the cool thing is because of that that knowledge soundness property, because the proof establishes not just that the secret key exists, secret keys will, will always exist, but that the prover actually knows it. Um, this uh, this proof is, is sort of enough information um, for the verifier to decide whether or not they should authenticate this client because it, it actually establishes that the client knows the secret key. Uh, I, I will make a small note, which is that this scheme is not quite secure. It's, it's vulnerable to replay attacks, but this gives you a sense of how, how ZK snarks can be brought to bear on a, an existing problem in security. Um, so this is what you can do with ZK snarks. Uh, how do you build them? The folks in, in this call know a lot about that, and I'm really not going to go into it today because it, it's very complicated and it's, it's kind of orthogonal to what we want to talk about, which is collaboration. Um, but I'll, I'll give you the names of the ZK snarks that we're going to be building on. Um, so in, in terms of ZK snarks based on, on pairing friendly elliptic curves, we'll be building on GROT16, Marlin, and Plonk. Um, the latter two will be instantiated with KZG as the underlying polynomial commitment scheme. Um, and, and, and these are all, all good uh, ZK snarks because they're very efficient, essentially. Um, but they're also vulnerable uh, to quantum attacks. Um, and so the last one that we consider is a ZK snark built from hashing um, and from uh, just facts about coding theory uh, called fractal. Um, so we'll also be building on that. Okay, and, and then you know, the, note there are a lot of ellipses on this on this slide. Um, I'm I'm not listing all of these case facts in the world. Um, these are just the ones that we're going to build on today. I um, mean, so even though these systems are so great, as I said before, um, they have a shortcoming, and that, and that shortcoming is um, what happens when there's not a single entity that knows all the secret information that's relevant to the proof. What if that that data is distributed in the custody of many entities? Which entity plays the role of the prover? They could like centralize all the secret data and you know give it to, to party A and party A could be the prover. But now party A learns everything, and we, we don't want that. We want, we want to try to keep uh, we we don't we want the parties to be able to write uh, zero knowledge proof while maintaining custody of their secret information. Um, and so that's that's sort of what the primitive that we're here to talk about today does. So a collaborative zk snark. Um, in, in terms of, of what a collaborative ZK snark is, it's actually pretty simple. It's a very natural generalization of a conventional ZK snark. And, and, and for a conventional ZK snark, you've got a prover, they've got a, sec a, a secret piece of information, we call it W, and they produce a proof, pi sub W, that establishes something about that secret. For a collaborative ZK snark, we're going to imagine that there are a collection of provers in this diagram three that each have a different piece of secret information, W1 through W3 in this diagram. And the idea is that those provers talk among themselves. They, they run some kind of interactive protocol that the output of the protocol um, is a single non-interactive proof, pi uh, sub W, but now it's, it's a W vector. So this proof establishes something about the vector of witnesses. Um, OK, so I see something in chat. From Victor, is this also you, a you can also you ignore that for now if you want. You can answer that at the end. Yeah, um, this is a totally great question, and I'm, I am going to ignore it for now because I think we're going to like start talking about this kind of soon. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. So, so how are we going to construct this? You can bet that in some sense, at least MPC is going to be involved. So yeah, so the idea is that you know the provers they talk among themselves, they they, they interact, um, run some multi-party protocol, and at the end you have this non-interactive proof that the verifier can can verify non-interactively. And, and now this proof is establishing a joint property of all the secrets, um, which you can think of as being a property of the vector of secrets. So when you make this um, generalization, oops, um, it, when we actually think about sort of how the syntax is changing, it's not changing too much. The, the setup procedure of ZK snark is syntactically just as it was before. Uh, the verification is syntactically just as it was before. The only thing that changes is proving. We no longer have a proving algorithm. Now we have a proving protocol uh, where all the parties are given the public parameters that define the proof system. And they're also all given X, the public data. And then parties uh, P1 through PN, provers P1 through PN, each have a different witness. And so then these provers are going to interact and they're going to produce this, this proof. 
Uh, so syntactically, this is this is sort of straightforward. Um, in terms of the security definitions, it's a little bit more complex, but still not too bad. One um, immediate thing that has to change is our notion of zero knowledge, because now um, if, if I'm a prover participating in this protocol, I don't just have to worry about the verifier learning things that shouldn't. I also have to worry that the other provers might be learning information that I don't want them to learn. Um, so I have my own individual secrets, every prover does, and they don't want that secret to be learned by the other provers. And so the way that we formalize this is with a property that we call T zero knowledge. And it says that any adversary at a high level, any adversary controlling at most T provers should learn nothing about the witnesses of the other provers beyond whether or not the witnesses are collectively valid. Um, and so uh, just to, to give a diagram, if we've got a, a sort of a five prover protocol here, um, parties one through five and, and witnesses one through five, and uh, there's an adversary who has corrupted three of these provers. These, th these three provers are, are colluding and trying to learn secrets about the others. If this, uh, the collaborative ZK snark that we're using has three zero knowledge, then this adversary should not learn anything about witnesses four and five beyond whether or not the witnesses are collectively valid. I um, mean, you know, in some sense, it's impossible to avoid leaking the validity of the witness because we're writing a proof here. So, you know, if it's not valid, the proof isn't going to be, isn't going to uh, be successfully checkable. Um, but but you, the, the idea, the definition says that you shouldn't learn anything more. So how do we formalize this? Um, we, we use basically the machinery of, of MPC security definitions. Um, so we imagine that there's an adversary that controls at up to, up to T provers. Um, and we require that there exists this simulator that when given the corrupted witnesses and X and that validity bit that indicates whether all the witnesses are collectively valid can simulate um, the view of this adversary. Um, and, and the idea is that if the adversary's view can be simulated without any of the secret information, the adversary hasn't learned any of the secret information. Uh, so this is sort of standard run of the mill uh, MPC style security definitions. Um, and then as an additional note, um, we do this, uh, we do our analysis and we specialize our definitions to the explicitly programmable random oracle model. Um, so, so for those who are sort of interested in the formalization. One thing that I want to note is that this definition subsumes traditional zero knowledge because you can think of the verifier as an adversary that controls none of the proofs. Um, so you know, a system that has even zero zero knowledge is going to be zero knowledge for the verifier. Um, so this is, this is in some sense a generalization. Okay, this is another question. Do individual provers know the total number of provers in the set? Ah, that's a really good question, um, Anna. And the answer is yes. So, so we imagine that, the, that a prover might learn how many other provers um, it's interacting with. And in fact, in some sense, it already knows that because the relation here takes um, one piece of public data and then N different pieces of private data. And, and N is, is gonna be leaked there. Um, now, one thing that a prover doesn't know is whether or not the other entities participating in the protocol are like sybils of one another or are really distinct identities. Um, and, and establishing that is sort of out of scope for this work. Okay, so uh, good question. Um, so this has been our definition of zero knowledge. Um, I'm going to go on and, and give the, the sort of the other modified definition, and then we'll pause for a moment for questions. So the second definition that needs to change is knowledge soundness. The, the fact that the prover knows the witness. And, and of course that needs to change because now there are more provers and the witness has been split into different pieces. Um, and there's all sorts of ways that you could imagine formalizing knowledge soundness in this collaborative setting. One natural formalization would be that prover one knows witness one, prover two knows witness two, and so on. Um, so, you know, in, in that system, when the verifier sees, sees the proof and the proof gets verified, the, the verifier knows that there, you know, there's a prover one that knows witness one and, and so on. Uh, but this is actually not the definition that we formalize. So we, we formalize a slightly weaker definition, which says that the provers, if they collectively pooled their, all their information, they could construct all of the witnesses. So this is, uh, this, this, it turns out that this notion of knowledge, it actually has a name. Uh, so if you go back to this, this old paper, in fact, my favorite paper in computer science, written by Halpern and, and Moses, um, uh, let's see, Joe Halpern and Yoram Moses at IBM back in the 90s. Formally, this is called distributed knowledge. So it's like what you would know if everybody pooled their, their distributed information. Um, and so this is, this is the definition that we end up formalizing. And, and actually, we believe it's a little bit harder to, we believe it's, it's somewhat hard to, to get a more precise notion of knowledge than this, because um, we're talking here about non-interactive proofs. The verifier doesn't interact with each prover individually. Instead, it receives a single message from all of them. Um, and in that setting, it's hard to imagine how the verifier could end up believing precise things about what different provers know. 
because it doesn't get to interact with them individually. And in fact, actually, from the verifier's perspective, perhaps this, this proof was written by one party simulating all the different provers in its head. Um, so getting a, getting a more precise definition, at least in a generic sense, is, is kind of tough. Um, Dara has posted this, this link to archive that I'm, I'm not going to follow up on right now because I, I don't want to change my screen, but um, I, I will follow up on it in the future. That, that's just the help in a message paper. Ah, yes, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, no, this, I, I would highly recommend that people read it. It really is my favorite paper in computer science. Um, okay, so uh, also we do this in the random Oracle uh, model. And so that means that uh, we imagine that there exists some extractor that gets to rewind the whole proving protocol, which it does by reprogramming the random Oracle. Um, this is sort of standard. Um, and, and, and sort of the interesting thing is it, it sort of generalizes very nicely to a, a multi-prover setting. Okay, so these are our security definitions. Um, I'll actually pause now in case we have any questions about them. Do you have any, um, I notice, no, I don't see any uh, notion of like liveness or otherwise like basically saying that uh, an adversary can't uh, halt the protocol. I guess is that kind of, is that kind of not a non-goal here? That that is going to be a non-goal. So so we're gonna we're, we're gonna limit ourselves to provers that actually want to produce the proof. Um, it's it's a good question. Um, what a sort of aliveness or like a guaranteed output delivery property would look like for a collaborative proof. Um, there are analogs of this in the MPC literature. The, the term is is guaranteed output delivery, and you need a strong number of honest parties to make it work out. But um, yeah, no, I think that would be an interesting generalization to consider, and it's not one that we have considered so far. Okay, so um, oh, uh, oh. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so if you have, I, I'm thinking of similar situations for um, threshold signatures, and in that in that case, you may have the problem that if um, the protocol is run concurrently um, with several instances, then um, there are attacks that there wouldn't be in the the single instance case, um, do the security, do your security definitions take that into account? Uh, it's a good question. And, and actually, we don't know the answer. So it's certainly true that in, in our experience doing cryptography, uh, let's see, if the protocol is zero knowledge, it may not be zero knowledge under parallel comp uh, composition. Um, that's sort of a protocol, to my knowledge, that's a protocol by protocol question. And, and we have not answered that for, for the protocols that we build here. Okay, that's a very thanks. good question. Um, and, and, and actually also, I, I would mention this at the end typically, but, but it's sort of related to your question. So I'll mention it now. One thing to be cautious of is that engaging this protocol ultimately leaks a single bit of information. And so, um, in an application, you, you want to be cautious about how some entity, having some entity be willing to engage in large numbers, um, of these, of these protocols, um, with the same secret information. Okay. Um, so let's, let's charge ahead. Um, so I, I, I want to get into the constructions in a moment here. Um, so this, you know, so this will sort of transform into like a more MPC style talk. Um, but before we get there, there, there's sort of one detail that we have to address, which is the class of relations that we're going to support. Um, and what we do here is pretty standard. We, we follow what people have done before by supporting, um, R1CS relations. And, and I, I don't really want to go into the details of what R1CS, uh, is today. Um, but suffice it to say that this is a class of relations that generalizes arithmetic circuit satisfiability. Um, so if your computation can be expressed as some kind of arithmetic circuit, um, where all the different part provers have inputs to it, and there are some public inputs, and you're checking whether or not, um, the output is zero or one, uh, then, then it's going to be covered here. Um, I, I do have the definition if you if you want to look at it, but maybe now is not the time. Um, but I, I want to say something, which is that we, we do something even more specific than focusing on R1CS. In particular, we assume that at the beginning of the proving protocol, we already have secret shares of the R1CS witness. So we have secret shares. You can think of it as every circuit of every wire in the circuit. Um, and and what we're sort of assuming here is that there exists a compilation phase that runs before the proof protocol. Um, and, and the assumption that we're making is actually a little bit stronger than what has traditionally um, been assumed in proof systems, and that we're assuming, first of all, that you can take your general relation and compile it into an R1CS relation. And we're assuming that that compiler also produces uh, a witness extension protocol that takes your general relation inputs and produces secret shares of the R1CS inputs. We believe that assuming this compilation phase is, is the right thing to do for this line of research, because what you want to do is you want to disentangle relation-specific details from the proof system. and, and this division uh, achieves that. 
Um, but it's a really interesting question. What compiler um, is going to be able to not only compile general relations to R1CS, but also produce these multi-party um, protocols that can, can do witness extension and produce secret shared um, R1CS witness material? Um, I, I actually think that our previous work, Cersei, would be great for this because it's sort of a compiler that, that can comprehend producing an MPC and producing uh, other kinds of relation uh, formats like R1CS. Um, but uh, of course, it doesn't have to be Cersei. And, and just I, I want to note that in general, this is sort of an interesting compilation problem, but it's not one that we're going to consider today. So for the purposes of today, we're imagining that our proving protocol is given secret shares of the R1CS witness and the public data. And its goal is to prove that that uh, witness um, demonstrates that X, the public data, really is in the R1CS relation. I'll pause here in case folks want to ask questions about this, because this is sort of a, it's, it's a lot to digest. My, my intuition is that that compilation is hard in general, because... It's I, definitely hard in general. So, so actually, let's just think about sort of like the worst case scenario, which is yeah. like a VDF. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Something that's highly sequential and is going to like, so like in general, that witness extension protocol, it might take a long time, especially if it's a, a very, if it has a high multiplicative depth and is like very unfriendly to MPC. Um, and that's in our, in our belief, that's probably unavoidable. Um, but the interesting thing that we're going to be observing today is once you have produced um, sort of the, the, the secret shares of the relevant information, uh, we're actually going to be able to write the proof that you did that correctly very quickly. So, so is there some general, even if it's extremely inefficient, way of doing this for an arbitrary statement? Of doing um, uh, the the the, um, the splitting into shares. So, I think one one thing that you can do um, is if you could take your um, statement and and actually express it as an arithmetic circuit that checks it, mm -hmm. um, then you can bring to bear traditional MPC generic MPC protocols and use them. And you can ask them to like save their secret shares as you go, assuming that the MPC protocol security properties are okay with that. Um, and then you can sort of take them at the end and write the proof. And, and then what you're doing, if, if you sort of like imagine that workflow, essentially the, the collaborative proof here is sort of boosting the security of the MPC so that parties who didn't participate in the MPC are also convinced that it was right. Uh, okay, that's, that's a nice way of thinking about it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's um, actually- fact, uh... Uh, sorry, yeah, I was saying it's actually a bit more complex than that because your generic MPC has to uh, not just check the relation but actually compute it. So things like inversions, you have to compute the inversion inside MPC versus um, for proving you just need the secret shares of the, of the inverse um, and you can do the multiplication. And so in practice, I expect the MPC to actually compute the secret shares to be much more expensive than the and be then the sort of collaborative seek is not proving. That might well be the case. And it's a really good question. I, I think ultimately the way that we thought of it is the cost of this MPC is going to depend on the relation and the cost of the proving stuff that we're going to talk about today does not. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to talk about that stuff because we can give a very clean answer to how expensive it is. Thanks. Um, but yeah, this, this, these other questions are like super interesting and definitely we want to look into as well. Okay, so let's let's charge ahead. Um, so how are we going to build these things? Uh, well, uh, someone earlier was asking, like, is MPC going to be involved? Do bet. Um, and, and, you know, it's sort of like one naive uh, approach for constructing these, and it actually ends up not even being, being too naive, is uh, you can bring to bear a generic MPC protocol. Um, and what these protocols do is they allow you to take any computation expressed as an arithmetic circuit and uh, securely evaluate it over secret shared data. That is exactly what we want here. Um, so you could imagine just taking your generic MPC protocol and instantiating it with a arithmetic circuit representation of your snark prover. Um, and you know that, that's the end of it. Um, but this, this uh, sort of this approach, while it solves the problem at a theoretical level, uh, has some, some practical concerns. Uh, and the practical concerns go like this. Uh, both ZK snark provers and generic MPC protocols are known for being slow. Um, I, I, uh, sort of like... Uh, Back of the envelope calculations, I often treat these like they're a thousand times slower than their underlying computation. The, the prover is a thousand times slower than just checking the property and the MPC protocol is a thousand times slower than computing the thing locally. And so the thing that we're worried about here is that when we take these two relatively expensive um, pieces of, of general purpose machinery and, and combine them, 
we're going to end up with something that's a million times slower than the underlying computation. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the really cool things that's, that's happening right now um, is that we're finding cool applications for, for SNARKs and for MPC, both of which are sort of a thousand times slower. But, but our fear was that something that's a million times slower is just too slow. Uh, and, and actually, I think that that's true in, in many scenarios. Um, yes, that, that, that is exactly how I feel, Alex. Yes, frowny face. OK. Um, so, so the question is whether or not we can affect this composition without eating the million-fold slowdown. And, and what we'll see is that the answer is yes. So we're going to end up accomplishing this composition um, with something like a 1,000 to 2,000x slow, slowdown. Um, so in, in particular, what we're going to show is that the, the collaborative proof in terms of wall clock proving time is just as fast as the ZK-SNARK prover um, or is about twice as slow as the ZK-SNARK prover. Uh, and uh, yeah, look forward to the, if you're skeptical, look forward to the evaluation because we'll, we'll sort of like look at this in many scenarios. Uh, how, does it, how does it vary with the number of parties? Yes, yes. So this is going to be for small finite numbers of parties and a, and a good network connection. Okay. Not like an unrealistic network connection, but a good one. And, and, and also like, we're, like the, if, if you start to imagine like evaluations in this space, there are a lot of variables. We're going to look at them all. OK, so let's, let's charge ahead. So um, our goal is to MPC the prover. We're going to find some way of doing this uh, slightly non-generically in, in order to avoid the, the terrible slowdown. And, and essentially, the project at this point becomes somewhat straightforward, I might say. Um, there, there are a lot of potential performance problems, and we just got to go through and clear them out. Um, and so uh, the, the first place to look is, of course, all of the traditional bottlenecks in single prover proofs. Because if those are getting dramatically slower in the multi-party computation setting, then that's going to be a problem. And so the first traditional bottleneck is, is elliptic curve operations. Um, it, these actually, it turns out, if you don't handle them right, they can become they, they can give you that, that million-fold slowdown. Um, but in the literature, they're the beginnings of a good solution to this problem. And, and in this work, we take uh, those ideas and develop them further. So I'll, I'll go into that in a slide or two, how we handle elliptic curve operations. Another traditional bottleneck, Fourier transforms. Um, when your proof system gets big enough, and assuming your proof system is using Fourier transforms, eventually those uh, actually even take longer than the elliptic curve operations. Um, and uh, the nice thing here is that the Fourier transform, as you might recall from your signals and systems engineering class, is a linear operator. Um, and because the MPC protocols that we're going to be building on uh, perform extremely efficiently on linear operators, these end up just not being a problem, which is great. Beyond the traditional single prover bottlenecks, we also have to think about operations that aren't traditional bottlenecks, but might become a bottleneck in the multi-prover context, often because these are operations that are highly nonlinear or have high multiplicative depth. Um, and there are a whole host of, of these potential problems. One example is polynomial divisions. Lots of provers reason about their data in terms of polynomials. Lots of them divide those polynomials by other polynomials. Polynomial division, highly nonlinear, could be a huge problem. Uh, but we go through our proof systems and we find out that actually for our proof systems, it's not a problem because, and this is somewhat technical, the divisor polynomial is always public. Um, and that means that when you view the operation as an operation on the secret data, it's actually linear. Uh, maybe that's not obvious. Maybe you have to prove it. You, you can see the paper. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's obvious depending on your background. Uh, so this ends up being very, very efficient, um, which is good. One thing that is, is, is sort of honest to God, highly nonlinear, is that uh, one of our, our provers, Planck, needs to compute a sequence of partial products. Um, so that is like the worst case. It's just a sequence of multiplications. Um, the, the depth of the circuit is as large as the sequence, and the sequence, it turns out, is very large. Um, but fortunately, it turns out that in the literature, um, uh, let's see, in a, in a very old paper by Barlon and Beaver, there is a special purpose MVC protocol for computing sequences of partial products that runs in a constant number of rounds. Um, and so we can just break that out. Uh, and then there's this sort of one final problem that's not a traditional bottleneck, but it could become a bottleneck in the, the multi-prover context, which is Merkle tree evaluations and in general hashing. Um, and this is of course critical for the hashing based SNARKs. Um, and it's potentially a problem because well, hashing is very, very nonlinear. <laughs> Uh, evaluating hash functions inside an MPC is, is not good. Um, and on this front, we, we sort of strike out. We, we, we have like a, a partial solution to it that we don't like very much. I'll tell you about the ideas we have so far. Um, but we're ultimately not able to get the hashing-based snarks to work as well as um, to, to work as well as the elliptic curve-based ones. Let's see, Pratus has a comment. It's linear because you can compute the polynomial division via FFTs and IFFTs. Yeah, that's 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 really great intuition for, for how it works. Um, it turns out that you know if the divisor is is, is uh, also secret, then things get more complicated, but but in the public case, bingo. 
Um, it's actually a good question. Do we use FFTs? So actually the answer is generally we, we end up not using FFTs for this because the divisor polynomial is not only public, it also has small degree. Um, and so um, you don't use the school book division. Well, I, I guess you do use, I mean, in one case you use the synthetic division algorithm. Um, but yeah, so, so we actually do not break up the FFTs. Um, you in, you in can actually use cases. standard um, sort of polynomial division, not the FFTs yeah. if, the, if the divisor is known. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so let's, uh, so, we, so we have two things to talk about. We're going to talk about how we handle elliptic curve operations. We're going to talk about um, hashing, um, and then we'll, we'll go into the implementation and evaluation. So um, unfortunately, I can't just tell you immediately how we handle elliptic curve operations. First, I have to give a little bit more background on how MPC protocols work. Um, and so the, let's do a little, a little crash course on those. So at a high level, MPC um, protocols, the, the generic ones, um, at least the ones that we're building on, uh, they allow you to evaluate an arithmetic circuit over a finite field. Um, so you know, the circuit has, um, the, the values are in some finite field, the gates perform uh, addition or multiplication, and we have secret shares of, of the inputs. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that the inputs are, are represented according to a secret sharing scheme that's defined by the MPC protocol. Um, there are all kinds of secret sharing schemes. The one that I want you to think about during today's talk is additive secret sharing, the, the classic. Um, where if you want to secret share a value X, you just come up with N random values that sum to X. And then you distribute those N random values among the parties. And now no party, in fact, no collection of N minus one parties has enough information to recover X on their own. So this, this so MPCs, stage one, they secret share their inputs. And then every generic MPC algorithm defines some kind of secure protocol for taking secret shared inputs and computing secret shares of their sum and or their product. Um, so these are sort of secure sub protocols just for computing pluses and multiplications. Um, and then once you have those secure sub protocols, you just sweep through the circuit, you evaluate um, every single gate using these secure sub protocols, you end up with secret shares of the outputs, and then you can reveal the secret shares to the other parties. Um, so these are the kinds of MPC protocols that we build on. Uh, more specifically, we build on, on two um, protocols. One of them is called speeds. It's, it's a classic. Um, and it has the cool property. It, it's kind of like additive sharing, and it has the cool property that it's secure as long as at least one party is honest. Um, and then we also build on a, a newer protocol called GSZ um, that was published at Crypto last year, uh, either last year or the year before. Um, and it is, uh, it's a little bit faster, um, but the downside is that it's only secure if a majority of the uh, parties are honest. So, um, these are two different uh, MPC protocols. They each have their own secret sharing scheme. Um, and in some sense, our techniques are going to apply to both. OK, so that's, that's sort of the landscape of how MPC works. Um, you can evaluate arithmetic circuits. How are we going to handle elliptic curve operations? Ah, OK, great. So Victor has a question. What does secure mean in this context? I'm really glad that you asked. So um, in the case of, of the um, In the case of the MPC protocol, the, 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 part, the notion of security that's going to be most relevant to what we're building is secrecy. So in the case of GSC, if a majority of the parties are dishonest, then they can learn potentially all the val wire values in the circuit. Um, and so ultimately, the, um, the security threshold for the MPC is going to correspond to the zero knowledge threshold for the collaborative ZK snark. But I do want to emphasize that the soundness of the snark, the fact that it's convincing, that is not contingent on any of the provers being honest. Does that give you some more useful information, Victor? OK, cool. I'm really glad that you asked the question. I should actually be talking about that myself. <laughs> OK, so back back to so elliptic curves. So, so you know, we can evaluate arithmetic circuits. How are we going to handle elliptic curves? Well, there's sort of a natural approach, which is, well, you know, elliptic curves, um, they're kind of complicated mathematical things. But basically, they're just x, y coordinates um, or, or maybe some other kind of coordinates over a finite field. Let's say x, y coordinates for now. And so what we can do is we can secret share those coordinates. We can have secret shares of x and secret shares of y for every curve point. Um, and then if we want to add two curve points in the elliptic curve sense of the word add, then we can just evaluate the elliptic curve formulas over these coordinates to compute the coordinates of the sum. Uh, the formulas are a little bit nasty, but you know they're not they're not too bad. 
Um, however, unfortunately, this, this approach ends up, um, while it's conceptually very nice, it, it ends up being very inefficient. And, and sort of the problem here is that even the elliptic curve addition formulas involve a whole bunch of multiplications in the field. And, and um, the way that MVC protocols work, addition is often very cheap. Um, and multiplication very expensive. Um, and so what we're seeing is that, that even basic elliptic curve operations, when you take this approach, end up being very expensive because they involve all these field multiplications. Um, so this is, this is an approach that doesn't work so well. Like I said, this is, this is the kind of thing that's going to lead to maybe not million fold slowdown, maybe like 100,000 fold slowdown, um, just kind of like back of the envelope. Um, and, and fortunately, though, there's, there's another way. So the second option is instead of secret sharing the x, y coordinates, you can secret share the curve points themselves as elliptic curves. Earlier, I described additive secret sharing, where you split a value into n values that sum to it. You could do exactly that, where the sum is now in the elliptic curve sense instead of the field sense. Um, so this is this is a and once you do this um, now doing additions uh, well you can in the case of out of the secret sharing do that share wise and in general uh, other secret sharing schemes have efficient elliptic curve addition um, sub protocols as well um, and these are especially nice because um, at least all the MPC protocols that we build on do not require any communication um, to do this kind of this this share wise addition. So this elliptic uh, curve secret sharing is very cool. Um, it turns out in the case of speeds, one of the protocols that we build on, folks have observed in the past that you can do this curve secret sharing, and it allows you to do quick elliptic curve additions, and it actually allows you to do uh, very quick uh, elliptic curve uh, scalar multiplications as well. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and then what we do is we, we show that for GSZ, which is this, this new MPC protocol that we were building on, the same technique essentially applies. Um, the, the GSZ protocol is also compatible with elliptic curve secret sharing. And, and in fact, both these protocols are even sort of compatible with mixed elliptic curve field secret sharing, where you've got some, some circuit that's doing field operations and curve operations in the same circuit. Um, and and you, can, you can run it all through the same MPC. I, I was going to ask about that, whether um, using elliptic curve um, sharing prevents or, or makes field additions less efficient? Yeah, so it, it doesn't. So, so the short answer is, so you, you imagine we call these circuits like elliptic curve circuits. They have uh, field operations in them. They have curve operations. Wires have types. They're either in the field or they're in the curve. Um, for our purposes, the field is always the scalar field of the curve. Right. Um, and the answer is, um, yeah, so like all, all of the field type wires, you secret share them in the field, all the curve type wires, you secret share them in the curve. And now you have a lot more sub protocols. So you have like a field field product sub protocol and a field field sub pro sub protocol and a field curve product pro sub protocol. And finally a curve curve sum protocol as well. Um, okay. and fortunately <laughs> it just all works. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit tedious to implement, but the theory is pretty clean. Um, okay, so so that's that's kind of the approach that we take to handling elliptic curve operations. Um, and under this approach, elliptic curve addition basically is going to slow down almost not at all in, in the MPC. Um, and then uh, curve scalar products can slow down in the case that both the scalar and the curve are secret. But it turns out that doesn't actually happen so often. Um, okay, so this I'm, I'm not going to go through like every step of the, of the construction, but this this sort of clears out the bottleneck from the perspective of, of elliptic curves, uh, from uh, from the perspective of the elliptic curve based snarks. Now I want to talk about hashing. Um, so for hashing, um, for the hashing based snarks, they do a lot of hashing for a lot of reasons, but but essentially it's it's all centered around these Merkle trees. Um, so they've got a whole bunch of values x1 through xn, a big vector. They want to hash them together pairwise in some kind of binary tree to get a root r. Um, and the, the problem here is that these values in our context are secrets. So they're going to be secret shared. And that means that these hashes are going to be evaluated over secret shared data. And hashing is highly nonlinear. In fact, it has to be for security reasons. Um, so this is going to suck. Uh, and and you know, it, just, it just does suck. Um, there's, there's frankly not a lot that you can do about it. Um, the one thing that, that, that we, we suggest um, is sort of the natural thing, which is that instead of um, having sort of like having the provers collectively compute a Merkle root for their vector, you could have each uh, prover compute a Merkle root for its own shares. Um, and then you could sort of treat these now n, big n as in the number of provers Merkle roots as your vector commitment <laughs> to this vector. Um, and then when you want to do an opening proof, every single prover has to produce their own um, opening path. And then you have to like add together the things that you open from all of the vectors or, or in general unshare. Um, so the downside of this is that the proof size um, ends up going up by a factor of n, the number of provers, and, and the verifier work also goes up by a factor of n. 
Um, there are ways around this, natural ways around this. In fact, um, one time I was giving this talk and Riyadh was in the audience and he was like, well, this is a, you know, a pretty natural approach here, which is like, you just do like a layer of proof composition where you take all of these Merkle proofs and you sort of like write a proof that you verify them correctly and added, and added the values correctly or in general, unshared the values correctly. Um, so yeah, indeed that, that sort of works and that'd be an interesting direction to explore. Um, but, but also it'd be nice to have like a, a post-quantum um, collaborative ZK snark where you don't have to do this kind of composition that we know is, is often very expensive in practice. Um, so yeah, on, on the hashing front, we end up not doing as well as we might hope, um, but um, the elliptic curve stuff went super well. So we went ahead and implemented all of that. Yeah, I, I guess you don't want to use pages and hashes because the whole point is to avoid is to be post-quantum in those proof systems. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly that. Um, and, but yeah, Pedersen hash would do the trick. Yeah, it would. And it would even make, allow us to use our fun elliptic curve stuff. So we would, you know, we, we would extra enjoy that, that solution. <laughs> Okay, so anyways, uh, we go ahead and we implement um, collaborative UK snarks. We our goal for the implementation was was very ambitious. Um, so we wanted to implement a whole bunch of different collaborative UK snarks built on a whole bunch of different underlying conventional proof systems. We wanted to build on Grot 16, Marlin, and Plunk. We thought that uh, collaborative UK snarks based on all of these should be quite efficient, but we didn't just want to say that. We wanted to show it. Uh, we wanted to build our collaborative ZK, ZK snarks to different levels of zero knowledge, that, that T variable. Um, and so we had two notions in mind. We wanted to support T less than N and also T less than N over two. Um, and on top of, of, of building all these collaborative ZK snarks, our goal was that, that our, our vision was that these should actually be able to be very concretely competitive with their conventional counterparts. Uh, so at this point, basically we thought that we should be getting within 10X of a, of a conventional ZK snark. Um, and uh, doing this is actually quite challenging because the existing ZK snarks, these are like mature code bases that are pretty well optimized. Um, and you know, we're, we're lazy. And so our, our goal was to be able to do this without having to work too hard. Um, in particular, we did not want to implement 10 years worth of optimizations. Um, and uh, sort of we, we envisioned that our secret sauce here was that we, we, we figured that we'd have to iterate a lot on sort of like specific sub protocols that were a performance um, problem. And so we needed some implementation strategy that was gonna allow us to swap out the protocol for prefix products or swap out the protocol for polynomial division. Um, and the, you know, the question is how do you actually do that in the implementation? And, and it turns out that there, there is a way. Um, so um, the, the opportunity that we saw is that there's this really nice code base developed by at least one, one person in this call called ArcWorks. Um, and ArcWorks is fantastic for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons it's fantastic um, is that all of the provers in ArcWorks are implemented generically over their elliptic curve. So the elliptic curve here is represented as this pairing engine. Um, and that's like just some trait. Uh, it's actually extremely big and complicated, but I, I summarized it very briefly here on this slide that defines how you do field operations in the base field and in the scalar field and how you do curve operations and, and all that kind of stuff and the different forms of the curve that are relevant. Um, but so the, the idea, the reason that ArcWorks is implemented this way is, you know, we do active research on elliptic curves and all, all the time we find better elliptic curves or elliptic curves, you know, we find out that an existing elliptic curve isn't as secure as we want. Um, and so ArcWorks was designed so that at any point in time you could swap out your elliptic curve and you, know, you could reinstantiate your proof system over a new curve. Um, and our, our idea was to sort of take advantage of, of that level of indirection, if you would, that, of that generality. I um, mean, so basically the, the way that we see it is, you know, there's the ArcWorks prover and there's the ArcWorks curve and the prover relies on the curve. Um, but we were going to cut that bond and insert some new stuff in the middle. Um, so we started by implementing the basic MPC, like the generic MPC protocols for both field and curve operations. So we did this twice, once for speeds, once for GSC. We actually did it a few other times for, for fun as well, but we won't get into that. Um, and, and so what we ended up with at this stage is a bunch of implementations of MPC protocols um, where like the object that you hold in the protocol isn't a value, but rather a, a secret sharing of the value that only has significance because you're in a multi-party protocol with like these other machines. And then we took these secret shares and we wrapped them in, in some kind of wrapper type that implemented the ArcWorks uh, curve and, and field and et cetera uh, interfaces. Um, and so the idea is that you have this token that that's the secret sharing and you can run the ArcWorks field add or, or curve add function on it. And it, it does that by way of a secure multi-party protocol that it runs with the other machines. Um, and then it gives you a new token, which is the output. Um, and then we just took this and we plugged it into the prover. Um, and you know, to first order, this just works. That's not quite a lie. Like it breaks like in a few specific situations and you have to fix it up. 
Um, but more or less this works in, and the sort of the cool thing is what it's allowing us to do is take this single machine prover, this, this prover that was written with only one machine in mind and kind of misappropriate it as this multi-party protocol. Um, and this, I, I want to emphasize this strategy does not work in general. Like in particular, there are things that you could do in your computer that do not translate into even an elliptic curve circuit. Um, but uh, for provers, it turns out that it does work and that's, that's pretty cool. Um, also, this code is public. So like if other people want to build MPCs on top of this, we would encourage them to do, do so. Um, but, but yeah, it's just kind of a cool thing. I have a question. You you had said originally you were building on both types of MPCs, but I'm not clear from this. Like, why are there two? Are you combining them, or are you actually doing separate uh, implementations? And where where are they? Like, which part are they being used for different parts of this, or are they just like options so you can see which one does best? Yes, it's, that's a great question, Anna. Um, so let, let's first by, start by talking about how this diagram reflects two, and then we'll talk about why we did two. Um, so the way that this diagram would reflect two of them is that we actually implemented two different MPC protocols and have two different wrappers around the MPC protocols that gives us gives rise to two different kinds of provers. And the reason that we did that we did two um, is because the two MPC protocols they are private against a differing number of malicious parties in the protocol. So one of them is private so long as the majority of the parties are honest. And the other one is private as long as at least one party is honest. And so these correspond to different T thresholds in the T zero knowledge property. So one of them is like N over two zero knowledge and the other one is like N minus one zero knowledge. So is one like fat, like faster to run, but less secure and one is more secure, but slower to run? That is exactly what we're gonna see. We haven't seen the performance yet, but yeah, it turns out the one that has a, a smaller zero knowledge threshold um, is, is gonna end up being a little bit faster. Okay, so let's actually take a look at that, that evaluation then. Um, so uh, the experimental setup is, is mostly pretty straightforward. Um, so the, the goal is always wall clock, wall clock proving time. That's what we're going to measure. We're going to change the number of provers, big N, the number of rank one constraints, little n, the link capacity. This is a multi-party computation, so uh, the sort of the network matters a lot. We'll be varying that as well. Um, we're going to be varying the base uh, conventional ZK snark as well as the MPC protocol that we use to, to generalize it to a collaborative ZK snark. This corresponds to varying T, the zero knowledge security threshold. Uh, we make two simplifications. First of all, we run all of the machines locally in single threaded mode. We don't believe that this is something that you have to do, but it makes the evaluation simpler, so we do it. Um, and then the other thing is that we skip MPC pre-processing um, for the, the proving proving phase. Um, and the reason that we do that is because we do a few calculations. And, and basically, we see that for our computations, even though MPC preprocessing is traditionally rather expensive, it's extremely cheap. Um, because sort of basically writing a proof is already so expensive. The MPC preprocessing kind of gets crowded out. Um, I think for a very large number of provers, that might be less true. So we we'd probably have to remove that simplification for a large number of provers. Okay, so anyways, those are the simplifications we make, um, and then we do a whole bunch of experiments uh, changing these parameters. Um, so let's start with the main experiment, where we change uh, essentially the number of rank one constraints. So we try to prove more complicated properties. Um, and we do this for a small number of parties. Um, I'll talk about the exact configurations in a moment, and we do this over a good link. So a three gigabit per second link, which is like what you can get over an ethernet cable like a LAN, and this is also what you'll get in a data center. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to sort of present the results piece by piece so I, I don't overwhelm us. Um, so the, the first uh, sort of experiment that we did is just the baseline. So we ran a single prover um, doing its computation locally and looked at how proving time grew as the number of constraints grew. And so here I'm showing this for the GROT16 uh, proof system. And you can see that this is slightly super linear, but it's, it's almost going up linearly. Um, and what we see is that for the uh, honest majority protocols. So for example, a three prover protocol that's private against one corrupt prover, so that, so that a corrupt prover here is in the minority. Um, as the number of constraints grows, proving time becomes essentially indistinguishable from single prover proving time, which is very cool. Um, and then for the malicious majority protocols, so three provers, two of which are corrupt, or two provers, one of which is corrupt, um, the proving time ends up being about twice the proving time of the conventional proof system. 
And so this, this pattern that the um, honest majority uh, version is just as fast as the single prover um, uh, algorithm. And the fully secure version is, is uh, twice as slow. Uh, that's repeated uh, throughout all of the different um, conventional ZK snarks that we build on. Uh, and I, I want to emphasize that this is pretty cool. Um, most uh, computations, when you put them into a multi-party computation, slow down by like a thousand fold. And, and you know, here we're seeing like one to two X slow down. So, so this, is, this is pretty, pretty exciting. Um, in our second experiment, though, um, we, we wanted to falsify some of these, these uh, ideal assumptions. Um, so and in particular, the second experiment considers many provers. We fix the number of constraints, and, and now we just increase the number of provers. And, and we also fix ourselves to the GROT16 um, GROT based collaborative proofs. Um, and what we see here is as the number of provers grows, the system does slow down quite a bit. Um, and so um, we're doing this for the two different security thresholds, honest majority and, and, and full security. Um, and in both cases, uh, the slowdown, which is sort of the, um, the the time that it takes to compute to, to produce the collaborative proof divided by the single prover time, is is growing. Um, and actually, one of the interesting things is that we're seeing that the um, the honest majority protocol, so the less secure protocol, initially it's faster, but as the number of provers gets big enough, it's actually slower. And uh, this is like sort of an opportunity for research. There's no reason that should be the case. That's just sort of an artifact of, of this particular uh, MPC protocol that we're building on. It would be, it would be good to try to, to close that gap. We also do experiments over uh, links that have lower capacity. Um, so over a bad network. So here we fix ourselves to two provers, a thousand constraints. We're doing the malicious majority protocol um, and we're doing this for different proof systems. And we're looking at how the slowdown increases as the bandwidth decreases. And so what we see is as you get down to megabit per second, which you can get more or less anywhere in the world, uh, slowdown is, is growing. It's getting up to like 16 or, or maybe 32, uh, but it's still not 1,000. And, and that, that's pretty cool. OK, um, so this is basically where we're at the end here. Um, a few things I want to discuss. Um, one thing that we saw in those latter experiments is actually, maybe I should pause. Uh, yeah, let me pause for questions on just the experiments before I wrap up. Okay, can you go back to the um, the one that's increasing with n? Yes. Uh, sorry, the previous one. The um, uh, oh, little, little n. Little yes. n. Yes. Yeah, sorry, little n, not big n. Uh, I, I'm I'm just having a look at the concrete performance here. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So, oh, so yeah, sorry, I should yes. talk about our baselines here. So our baselines yeah. here for GROT16 and Marlin are the existing ORCworks implementations, which I think are not quite state-of-the-art. Um, uh, and then for Plonk, it's our own very, very bad Plonk implementation. Don't, don't use it. Um, and um, so, so sort of we believe very strongly that for almost any implementation, you should be able to get the 1 or 2x slowdown. Um, but of course, we're only showing that for the, for the ORCworks implementations. Okay, yeah, there's, there's nothing surprising to me here. So that's good. <laughs> Any questions about the other experiments? Okay, is, do you have figures for um, where you have a sort of a, a moderate number of provers and also a fairly large circuit? So let's say um, uh, two to 16 constraints and 20 provers, something like that. Uh, we, I don't. I don't have those numbers, but the, this the performance is predictable enough that I think we can we can compute them right now in real time. Um, so like, let's okay. say that it's thirty two provers, so our slowdown is like sixteen from yeah. that. Well, actually, I guess you'd be using you'd be using speeds there. So our slowdown is more like three, I guess. Okay. Um, and so now let's go back. So like, how big do we want our circuit to be? <laughs> uh, two to sixteen. Two to the sixteen. Okay, cool. Yeah. So it seems like. Uh, well, let, let's say two to the fifteen, for because it's easier to. To read off. Yeah, so it seems like um, so the, our, our single approver variant here is running in about eight seconds, and we expect the slowdown to be about three from the previous plot. Um, so that's going to be like 24 seconds. Okay, pretty good. To be clear, though, this is all over a three gigabit per second link. And so if the link is yeah. not so good, then that's like another source of slowdown. So, so what about bandwidths? The, yeah. the, the, the total um, sort of transmitted data? Ah, uh, yeah. Do we have like the the like net communication? We we yeah. actually didn't record that. Um, um, ballpark. It's going to be like probably a kilobyte per, maybe a little bit less than a kilobyte per gate, I guess. Um, 
but yeah, I, unfortunately, I, we, we did not measure that. Okay, that, that's not too bad for some applications, yeah. Okay, so um, let's charge ahead. So, okay, um, discussion. Um, so there's a few notes. So one thing that actually is even coming up right now is as the number of parties grows, as the network uh, degrades, eventually communication becomes the bottleneck, not, not computation. Um, and so a natural question is whether or not you can improve uh, the amount of, of, of communication that we're using. And we, we think that that's definitely possible, um, but we do show a partial asymptotic lower bound in this space. Um, so in particular, um, if you consider only two provers and you consider an additive secret sharing scheme, or it turns out you can, you can show this, I, I believe, for any linear secret sharing scheme as well, although, although we did not do that, uh, there's, there's actually an omega of little n lower bound on the amount of communication that you need. So if my circuit has size little n, then asymptotically, I need at least little n communication. And that, that it turns out, is just unsurmountable. Uh, in particular, you can show a reduction from this classic problem called disjoint, which is known to be communication complexity hard. <laughs> um, so uh, th there's a reduction from it to constructing a collaborative ZK snark. Um, and that gives us a partial lower bound. We actually think there's a lot of interesting sort of follow-up communication complexity work to be done here. Um, we think that there are a lot, there are stronger bounds that should also hold, um, but we were writing a security paper, not like a communication complexity paper. So we didn't try to, to prove these. Another really important thing to do is to use parallelism within the prover. Um, we don't believe that there's any reason that you, you can't do this. Um, the the par sort of the parts of the prover that are traditionally accelerated with parallelism are local. Um, in our collaborative ZK snarks, so it should it should be pretty straightforward, but we we didn't do it, and that would be a good thing to do. Uh, and then finally, as I alluded to earlier, it would be nice to have um, a better post quantum collaborative ZK snark. Okay, so um, basically at the end here, um, hopefully as promised, you've learned what collaborative ZK snarks are. If you forget everything else, you should remember that they support zero knowledge proofs for distributed secrets. And if you can remember one more bit of information, you should remember that they seem to be very concretely efficient. Um, typically, multi-party computations are like a thousand-fold slower than their undistributed version, and here we're seeing slowdowns of like one to two x, um, and then the, or as good as one to two x, and, and that's pretty cool. Uh, it's, it's interesting to think about why that's the case. Um, you know, essentially, these uh, these provers they're highly algebraic, highly linear, um, and we're able to take advantage of that in the MPC protocol. And, and snarks are not the only algebraic cryptographic protocol, so it, it makes sense to think that this approach could be uh, applied to create collaborative versions of other primitives as well. Uh, so uh, at the end of the talk, thank you very much. I'll take any final questions and then I guess we'll wrap up. So, so let's say you're using the um, elliptic curve sharing. Um, my, my intuition is that it's surprising that you don't get more slowdown just as a result of doing that because the cost of an elliptic curve addition is obviously significantly worse than a field addition. Yes, yes. So I, I think I'm gonna like focus that question on one specific operation, which is the huge multiscalar multiplication that basically, sorry, yeah, multi-scalar multiplication yes. that basically every single uh, snark that we ultimately implement needs to do. Um, and so for this multi-scalar multiplication, we have to do a lot of elliptic curve operations already. So the question is just, do we have to do more? <laughs> yeah. Um, and in the case of GSC, which is using Shamir sharing, it turns out the answer is no. You're doing a different multi-scalar multiplication, but but um, you're, you're still doing one multi-scalar multiplication. The size is the same. In the case of speeds, it turns out you have to do two. Um, and the intuition here is that the way that speeds works is that you have an additive secret sharing, and then you have essentially an additive secret sharing of a Mac or an authentication code on the original data. And you more or less just have to duplicate the computation. You do the MSM to both of these. Um, and so that's like exactly where the 2x slowdown comes from. OK, yeah, that's, that's pretty intuitive. Thanks. So, so there really is that—that that is where all of your overhead is coming from, basically. Yes. Yeah. In the case of speeds, it's just—it's yeah. like you're duplicating the computation. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is the classic example of you—you you design the system, you optimize it, you predict the performance, and the implementation meets your expectations exactly. Cool. Awesome. A uh, couple 
couple uh, or some words of gratitude in the chat from everybody. Uh, aside from those, does anybody else have any final questions for Alex? Okay. Hey, this was awesome, Alex. Thanks so much for presenting this work. Uh, it was really, really good discussion. And, uh, and this is really exciting. Hopefully we'll be able to see um, this applied somewhere out in industry here soon. And thanks again for coming back on ZK Study Club. Yeah, my pleasure. And, and, and of course, uh, hopefully it goes without saying, but um, you know, this is a cool thing, but it'd be cooler if people needed it for some reason or wanted to use it. So if that's the case, come talk to us. The implementation is public. There's a link on the slides. Nice. Um, awesome. But but also we're happy to to play a, a support role there um, as well. Yeah, and, and if you want to share the slides with me after this, then uh, I can post it on the uh, on the YouTube channel as well. So yeah, I'll do that.